Hello, my name is Kevin Craig. This presentation is on feedback control system basics. Feedback control is also known as closed loop control. One of the first applications of feedback control is the flyball governor to control the speed of a steam engine. This flyball governor was invented by the Scottish engineer James Watt in 1789. We see a picture of the invention along with a schematic. Two questions come to mind. What is feedback control? And why is this an example of feedback control? To answer the first question, I show two block diagrams. The top diagram is an open loop control system. The bottom block diagram is a closed loop or feedback control system. Both systems have the plant or process G, which represents the system we wish to have behave in a certain way. The output variable of that plant or process, the control variable, we identify by the variable C, which we show in both diagrams. There are two possible inputs to our plant or process. The first is the input we have control over, the manipulated input to the plant, which we represent by the symbol M, and we see that in both diagrams. The other input to the plant is the input we have no control over. It's called the disturbance input, represented by the symbol D, and we see that in both diagrams. Both diagrams have a controller, G sub C. This is the controller that we design so that the control variable C will follow the reference input R. And the same applies to both the open loop system and the closed loop system. We want C to track the reference input. In the open loop system, we do not measure the control variable and we rely on the reference input being somewhat constant, not changing very much. We rely on the performance specifications being not very stringent, and also that disturbances are not too great. If those all apply, the open loop system can give acceptable performance. The closed loop system, however, measures the control variable. That's the variable we want to behave in a certain way. And it measures that with a feedback element or a sensor we identify with the variable H. The output of that feedback element we call the feedback signal B. That feedback signal is compared to the reference input. Based on that difference, which we call E, the actuating signal, the actuating signal is sent to the controller, and the controller acts on that signal to make the control variable follow the reference input. Now, there are many other benefits to feedback control, but basically, in comparing open loop control to feedback control, we see the two main differences. In the open loop control system, the control variable is not measured. In the closed loop control system, the control variable is measured. And then the output of that feedback element is compared to the reference input. Based on that difference, we take action. And the controller G sub C takes action. The open loop control system is almost always stable, while the feedback control system can go unstable. And we will learn why later on in the presentation. The difference between stable and unstable is analogous to a ball inside of a hoop. If I displace this ball from its stable equilibrium position up to the side of the hoop, it will 
roll back and forth and eventually come to rest back in its original position. If I place a ball on top of a hoop in an unstable equilibrium, equilibrium position and I displace the ball, the ball will not return to its equilibrium position but will just fall off. So feedback control systems can go unstable and stability must be guaranteed before performance of the control system can even be addressed. Open loop control systems are almost always stable unless we have a situation where the plant is inherently unstable like an inverted pendulum system is. With this brief introduction to open loop control and closed loop control, Let's now explain why Watt's flyball governor is an example of feedback control. Shown is a schematic of Watt's flyball governor. Watt's flyball governor is an early example of an automatic control system, a feedback control system, consisting of an error sensor connected by a negative feedback loop to a control device which drives the error to zero, thus maintaining a desired operating point. All feedback control systems have negative feedback. The drive shaft of Watt's speed sensor is geared to the steam engine's main drive shaft and rotates at a convenient speed in unison with it. As it rotates, the two heavy balls are driven outwards by the centrifugal force. As the weights fly outwards, a sliding ring on the drive shaft is pulled downwards by the scissor mechanism supporting the weights. This displacement of the ring along the shaft represents the magnitude and direction of the speed error. A linkage mechanism provides the feedback loop, which transfers this movement to the butterfly valve of the throttle control. The pivot in the linkage reverses the direction of the error signal, thus providing the negative feedback. If the engine speed is too high, the centrifugal force on the sensor's weights will cause the actuator rod to be raised, in turn causing the butterfly valve to move so as to restrict the flow of steam into the engine, reducing its speed. So if the speed is too high, the centrifugal force will cause these balls to move out. This will cause the sliding ring to move down. This will cause the actuator rod to be raised, thus restricting the flow of steam. Conversely, if the engine speed is too low, the centrifugal force will be lower. You see the balls will move in. The weights will be closer to the drive shaft the sliding ring will ride higher on the drive shaft. This will force the actuator rod downwards, opening up the butterfly valve to admit more steam into the engine, thus increasing its speed. The desired speed of the engine is set by means of a screw thread on the actuator rod, which adjusts the rod's length thus enabling the angle of the butterfly valve to be set to the corresponding operating point. So this invention is one of the first examples of feedback control. All modern multidisciplinary engineering systems have feedback control. The physical system, which could be mechanical, fluid, thermal, chemical, electrical, biomedical, civil, or multidisciplinary, mixed, is the plant or process that is the subject of our attention. Actuators make things happen, sensors tell us what's happening, and the engineer designs the complex decision making to control this modern multidisciplinary engineering system. And that decision making is embedded in a computer which performs the real-time control. 
This then is a modern multidisciplinary engineering system. 21st century control design is a bit more complicated than the feedback control system I showed previously. A 21st century controller consists of three elements, a feed forward controller, a feedback controller, and a disturbance observer. The actual physical system consists of the actuator, the plant, and the sensor. The first step in the design process is to model the physical system by making simplifying assumptions. The physical model based on the simplifying assumptions then is used to create the mathematical model. We apply the laws of nature to the physical model and the result is the mathematical model of the physical model of the physical system. The goal of feedback control is multifold. We want to guarantee absolute stability of the closed loop system. We want to reject disturbances. We want the system to be insensitive to changes in the parameters of the physical system, as well as be insensitive to unmodeled high frequency dynamics or high frequency noise. And then we want performance. We want the control variable to track the reference input. So absolute stability, performance, disturbance rejection, robustness, these are the goals of 21st century control design. The feedback controller is designed based on the mathematical model of the physical model. And it is meant to address the issues of absolute stability, disturbance rejection, noise rejection, robustness, insensitivity to variations in the parameters of the physical system, as well as insensitivity to unmodeled high frequency dynamics, and of course, high frequency noise. The feed forward controller's goal is to have the control variable track the reference input. So the closer that the physical model is to the actual physical system, the better the feed forward controller and the feedback controller will work with the physical system, since they were designed based on the physical model. The goal of the disturbance observer is to make the physical system behave like our physical model. It does that by taking the actual output of the physical system and putting it through a design model inverse to generate the input into the physical model that would result in this output control variable C. It then takes that input and compares it to the actual input to the physical system. And it treats this difference as a disturbance, which the feedback controller will try to reject. There are some mathematical technicalities in doing this, which we will address later on. But the goal of the disturbance observer is to make the physical system behave like your physical model. If it does that, then the feedback controller and the feed forward controller will work much better as they were designed based on the physical model. So feedback control and feed forward control are complementary. And as we see, they are often used with a disturbance observer to enhance performance. So to summarize, Control is a hidden enabling technology that is present in almost every engineered system today. Despite this fact, control system design is still mysterious and often falls in the domain of a specialist. Today, every engineer must know how to design, implement, and integrate a control system into a design from the start of the design process. An engineer needs to understand how to balance performance low cost, robustness, and efficiency to effectively accomplish these goals.
Evaluating a design concept is best done through modeling, not by building and testing, as modeling provides true insight on which to base design decisions. There is a hierarchy of models possible of varying complexity and fidelity, but a simple control-oriented design model which captures essential attributes is the most useful, that is, the dominant dynamics. An integrated control system can enhance a design through stabilization, demand following, disturbance and noise rejection, and robustness. All of this can be accomplished through a combined approach, rather than trying to accomplish all with a single feedback controller, as is too often the case. The design model is typically used for both feedback and feedforward controller design. However, in practice, the physical system will deviate from that design model. A disturbance observer regards any difference between the physical system and the design model as an equivalent disturbance applied to the model. It estimates the disturbance and uses it as a cancellation signal. So in addition to enhancing disturbance rejection, the disturbance observer makes the physical system behave like the design model over a certain frequency range, thereby simplifying the design of the feedback and feedforward controllers. Since the design model inverse is not realizable, a unity gain, low pass filter, specifying the observer bandwidth is added. Next, the feedback controller is designed solely to force dynamic consistency by mitigating the effects of model uncertainty and disturbances, usually with high gain and integral control. A common mistake is made in designing the feedback controller for desired output with no regard for robustness, only to find poor performance when applied to the physical system. However, once consistency is enforced, the desired output can be augmented with a feedforward controller, typically the dynamic model inverse, to recover the dynamic delay of the closed loop system with no effect on stability or properties of the closed loop system. Integrated modeling, design, and control implementation. During the design of mechatronic systems, it is important that changes in the physical system and the controller be evaluated simultaneously. Although a proper controller enables building a cheaper physical system, a badly designed physical system will never be able to give good performance by adding a sophisticated controller. Therefore, it is important that during an early stage of the design, a proper choice be made with respect to the physical system properties needed to achieve a good performance of the controlled system. On the other hand, knowledge about the abilities of the controller to compensate for physical system imperfections may enable that a cheaper physical system be built. This requires that an early stage of the design, a simple model is available that reveals the performance limiting factors of the system. It is important that the modeling of physical systems is done in a way that the dominant physical parameters are preserved in the model and that the controller design can be done simultaneously. Here are the feedback control topics. Control system types, open loop control, both basic and feed forward, and closed loop control, or feedback control. The top 10 control concepts and control system design procedure. Block diagrams and loading effects. Generalized feedback control block diagram. Feedback control transfer functions. Sensitivity of control systems to parameter variation. Negative feedback and op amps. 
instability in feedback control systems, performance instability, disturbance response, command feed forward control, proportional integral and derivative control modes, and PID control digital implementation. Let's formally talk about control system types. The focus of our attention is the plant or the process. There are two types of inputs into the plant or process. Inputs we have control over are called manipulated inputs. Unwanted inputs, inputs we have no control over, are called disturbance inputs. We want the plant or process to respond in a certain way. These variables are called response variables. Why do we need controls? Command following, disturbance and noise rejection, robustness, insensitivity to parameter variations, and also insensitivity to unmodeled high frequency dynamics. And of course, absolute stability must be guaranteed before we consider any of these. Control systems are an integral part of the overall system and not afterthought add-ons, meaning we don't design the system and then just add on the controls. The earlier the issues of control are introduced into the design process, the better. It must be an integrated design approach. Controls and system design must occur simultaneously. And everything needs controls today for optimum functioning. There are two basic control system types, the open loop control and the closed loop or feedback control. In open loop control, we don't measure the variable we want to control. There is the basic control configuration for open loop control, and that can be augmented with feed forward control, what we call input compensated feed forward control of which there are two types, disturbance compensated feed forward control and command compensated feed forward control. In closed loop control or feedback control, we measure the variable we want to control, and then we compare it to what we want that variable to be. Based on that difference, we take action. Under closed loop control, there are two different approaches. In the classical approach, we transform the differential equations into algebraic equations in terms of the Laplace variable S or the differential operator D. Under classical control, there are two design approaches, the root locus approach to control design and the frequency response approach to control design. The other category for closed loop control is what is called modern or state space control. In state space control, the differential equations are left in the time domain and all design is done in the time domain. They are not transformed into algebraic equations as we do in the classical approach. In addition, there are advanced approaches to feedback control or closed loop control, adaptive, and fuzzy logic are two examples. At the end of this presentation, as a supplement, I've added introductory notes on adaptive control and fuzzy logic control. Shown is a block diagram of the basic open loop control system. The plant is the focus of our attention. The inputs to the plant are the plant manipulated input, which we have control over, and the disturbance input, which is unwanted and which we do not have control over. The variable of interest is the output of the plant called the controlled variable. Note that in this type of control, we do not measure the controlled variable. Or if we do measure the controlled variable, we do not use it for control purposes. We would use it just to record the output for documentation. 
The control effector controls the flow of energy and or material to the plant. And the control director tells the control effector what to do. The input to the control director is the desired value of the controlled variable. This is where we program our algorithm, our control algorithm, so that the control variable will follow the desired value of the controlled variable. This type of control is satisfactory if disturbances are not too great, changes in the desired value are not too severe, performance specifications are not too stringent. You would be hard pressed to find examples of open loop control in today's modern engineering applications. The basic open loop control configuration can be augmented with input compensated feed forward control. And here is an example of disturbance compensated feed forward control. Here for a particular disturbance input, we measure the disturbance with a disturbance sensor. And then we have to compensate our controller, add to our controller, a disturbance compensation. And for that, we need to estimate the effect of the disturbance on the controlled variable, and we compensate for it. So the basic idea of disturbance compensated feed forward control is that we measure important load variables and we take corrective action before they upset the process. In contrast, a feedback controller, as we will see, does not take corrective action until after the disturbance has upset the process and generated an error signal. There are several disadvantages to disturbance compensated feed forward control. The low disturbances must be measured online. In many applications, this is not feasible. The quality of the feed forward control depends on the accuracy of the process model. One needs to know how the controlled variable responds to changes in both the load and manipulated variables. Lastly, ideal feed forward controllers that are theoretically capable of achieving perfect control may not be physically realizable. Fortunately, practical approximations of these ideal controllers often provide very effective control. The second type of open loop input compensated feed forward control is called command compensated feed forward control. Here, based on the knowledge of the plant characteristics, the desired value input is augmented by the command compensator to produce improved performance. So for example, if the desired value of the controlled variable is just some new value, and the output from our control director is simply a step command, the command for the controlled variable to go to some new value. But if the knowledge of the plant or process tells us that that response of the controlled variable will be very slow and sluggish, we can augment this step command with an input as shown to speed up the response of the controlled variable initially and still get to the same steady state. So this is the second type of input compensated feed forward control called command compensated feed forward control. Some comments about open loop systems. Open loop systems without disturbance or command compensation are generally the simplest, cheapest, and most reliable control schemes. These should be considered first for any control task. If specifications cannot be met, disturbance and or command compensation should be considered next. When conscientious implementation of open loop techniques by a knowledgeable designer fails to yield a workable solution, 
the more powerful feedback methods should be considered. How is an open loop control system converted to a closed loop or feedback control system? Here we show a block diagram of a feedback control system. The open loop control system is converted to a closed loop control system by adding measurement of the controlled variable. So we have a controlled variable sensor or a feedback element that tells the control director what the controlled variable is. Then in the control director, we compare the measured value of the control variable with its desired value. And based on that difference, we take action. So the two elements that are added to an open loop control system to convert it to a closed loop or feedback control system are measurement of the control variable and then comparison of the control variable measurement to what we want it to be, to the command. And based on that difference, we take action. There are four basic benefits of feedback control. Feedback control will cause the controlled variable to accurately follow the desired variable. However, corrective action occurs as soon as the control variable deviates from the command. So there is a time delay involved. Feedback control greatly reduces the effect on the control variable of all external disturbances in the forward path. It is ineffective in reducing the effect of disturbances in the feedback path that is those associated with the sensor, and disturbances outside the loop, those associated with the reference input element. So accurate measurement of the control variable is essential to the success of feedback control. Feedback control is tolerant of variations due to wear, aging, environmental effects, and so forth, in hardware parameters of components in the forward path, but not those in the feedback path, those associated with the sensor or outside the loop. For example, those associated with the reference input element. And lastly, feedback control can give a closed loop response speed much greater than that of the components from which they are constructed. There are inherent disadvantages of feedback control. No corrective action is taken until after a deviation in the control variable occurs. Thus, perfect control, where the control variable does not deviate from the set point during load or set point changes, is theoretically impossible. So there is a time delay. It does not provide predictive control action to compensate for the effects of known or measurable disturbances. It may not be satisfactory for processes with large time constants and or long time delays. If large and frequent disturbances occur, the process may operate continually in a transient state and never attain the desired steady state. And in some applications, the controlled variable cannot be measured online and consequently, feedback control is not feasible. I'm a big fan of top 10 lists. So here is a control design top 10 list. This top 10 list should be read now as you begin your study of feedback control to preview the most important concepts. And then periodically, as you learn more and more about this important aspect, of modern engineering practice. One, feedback control is a pervasive, powerful, enabling technology that at first sight looks simple and straightforward, but is amazingly subtle and intricate in both theory and practice. Two, in a dynamic system, changes cannot be affected instantaneously. And so an otherwise correct control decision applied at the wrong time could result in catastrophe. 
Three, nonlinearities are always present. For example, backlash, Coulomb friction, saturation, hysteresis, quantization, dead band, and kinematic nonlinearities. A linearized model can be used to approximate a nonlinear system near an operating point. Four, stability of a dynamic system must be guaranteed. Closed loop systems go unstable because of an imbalance between strength of corrective action and system dynamic lags. Stable systems must have adequate stability margins to work once built. Five, stable systems have a frequency response. If a stable linear system has a sinusoidal input applied, then the steady state output will be a sinusoid of the same frequency. However, the amplitude ratio and phase difference of the two sinusoids are frequency dependent. Six, the open loop transfer function is the product of all the transfer functions in the loop. That is controller, actuator, plant, and sensor. Compared to the closed loop system transfer function, the open loop transfer function is much less complex. The Nyquist criterion and the root locus procedure allow one to use the open loop transfer function to predict closed loop system performance. Seven, after stability, performance is everything. Command following, disturbance rejection, insensitivity to modeling errors, insensitivity to unmodeled high frequency dynamics and noise, are the main reasons for using feedback control once a system is guaranteed to be closed loop stable. Eight, time delays can be deadly. Always conserve phase, the equivalent of time delay. Integral control adds 90 degrees of phase lag at every frequency. And digital control adds time delay primarily due to digital to analog conversion. Imagine trying to make decisions using old information. Nine, high control gain has lots of benefits. For example, good command tracking and good disturbance rejection. However, there are three areas of concern, roll off, saturation, and noise. Lastly, people's lives may be at stake. There are no details in control engineering, as even the most insignificant detail may prove to be important. Real control systems must be extremely reliable, especially if people's lives depend on them. When an engineer is asked to solve an engineering problem, he or she follows a process. The process usually involves the following steps stating in one's own words the problem, the given information, the need, what has to be found, drawing a diagram of the physical situation, listing the laws of nature that might be needed to solve the problem, listing all simplifying assumptions to be made in the solution of the problem, proceeding with the solution using variables, substituting numbers only when it becomes appropriate, making sure that the units are correct and the proper number of significant figures used. Then reviewing the answer in light of the simplifying assumptions made to see if it makes sense. And all of this has to be done in a professional manner so anyone can understand the solution without having the engineer there to explain each step. There is a feedback control system design procedure. Control engineering is an important part of the design process of most dynamic systems. As we know, the deliberate use of feedback can stabilize an otherwise unstable system, can reduce the error due to disturbance inputs, can reduce tracking error while following a command input, 
and can reduce the sensitivity of a closed loop transfer function to small variations in internal system parameters. That's robustness. Remember that the purpose of control is to aid the product or process. That is the mechanism, the robot, the chemical plant, the aircraft or whatever to do its job. Engineers must take into account early in their plans the contribution of control to the design process. More and more systems are being designed so that they will not work without feedback. Control system design begins with a proposed product or process whose satisfactory dynamic performance depends on feedback for stability, disturbance regulation, tracking accuracy, reduction of the effects of parameter variations. Having a general step-by-step -step approach for feedback control system design serves two purposes. It provides a useful starting point for any real-world controls problem. It provides meaningful checkpoints once the design process is underway. And as the diagram shows, the system design must include system dynamics and control structure from the very start of the design process in an integrated way. The modern multidisciplinary engineering system includes the physical system, the focus of our attention. Actuators make things happen. Sensors tell us what's happening. A computer is used for real-time control execution. What is required is simultaneous optimization of all system components. Here is a diagram of a multidisciplinary engineering system design team. The design team includes a mechanical engineer, an electrical electronics engineer, a controls engineer, and a computer systems engineer. In addition, there will be social scientists and non-technical experts, problem-specific engineers, physicists, chemists, mathematicians, and computer scientists, and business experts contributing to the design. What is most important is that there are no silos, that all of the engineers in this multidisciplinary team work in an integrated way and are able to communicate with each other. Also, there are no comfort zones. Engineers in this multidisciplinary team have to become comfortable with being uncomfortable. When all of this is done at the center, the result is a human-centered, model-based, multi multidisciplinary system design. The sequence of steps for feedback control system design are as follows. Step one, understand the process and translate dynamic performance requirements into time, frequency, or pole zero specifications. What is the system and what is it supposed to do? The importance of understanding the process cannot be overemphasized. Do not confuse the approximation with the reality. You must be able to use the simplified model for its intended purpose and return to an accurate model or the actual physical system to really verify the design performance. Examples of dynamic performance requirements include time response. This is a plot of the response of the system Y versus time, where we see the response within an envelope that specifies the required rise time, overshoot, and settling time for the system. Frequency response. This is the open loop Bode magnitude plot and the open loop Bode phase angle plot. At low frequency, 
we want the magnitude plot to have high gain to ensure good disturbance rejection, good command following, insensitivity to parameter changes in the system. At high frequency, we want low gain to ensure insensitivity to unmodeled high frequency dynamics and high frequency noise rejection. And at the crossover frequency where the magnitude is zero dB, we want the slope to be minus 20 dB per decade for a decade below and a decade above the crossover frequency to ensure adequate phase stability margin. And lastly, a root locus plot, which shows the location of the closed loop poles of the system on the imaginary or complex plane where the horizontal axis is the real axis, the vertical axis is the imaginary axis, and where this border shows the boundary where the poles of the system, the closed loop poles, need to be to the left of. And this ensures adequate damping ratio, undamped natural frequency, and settling time. So this is a composite boundary that specifies damping ratio, undamped natural frequency, and settling time. And if the closed loop poles are located to the left of this border, then those requirements will be met for a second order dynamic system. The second step in the process is to select the types and number of sensors considering location, technology, functional performance, physical properties, quality factors, and cost. If you can't observe it, you can't control it. Which variables are important to control? Which variables can physically be measured? Select sensors that indirectly allow a good estimate to be made of the critical unmeasurable variables. It is important to consider sensors for the disturbances. For example, in chemical processes, it is often beneficial to sense a load disturbance directly because improved performance can be obtained if this information is fed forward to the controller. So this is disturbance compensated open loop feed forward control. Step three, select the types and number of actuators considering location, technology, functional performance, physical properties, quality factors, and cost. In order to control a dynamic system, you must be able to influence the response. The actuator does this. Before choosing a specific actuator, consider which variables can be influenced. The actuators must be capable of driving the system so as to meet the required performance specifications. Step four, make a linear model of the process, actuator, and sensor. Take the best choice for process, actuator, and sensor. Identify the equilibrium point of interest. Construct a small signal dynamic model valid over the range of frequencies included in the performance specifications. Validate this model with experimental measurements where possible. Express the model in many forms, state variable, pole zero, and frequency response forms. Simplify and reduce the order of the model if necessary. Quantify model uncertainty. Step five, 
make a simple trial design based on concepts of lead lag compensation or PID control. To form an initial estimate of the complexity of the design problem, sketch a frequency response plot, a Bode plot, and a root locus plot with respect to plant gain. If the plant actuator sensor model is stable and minimum phase, the Bode plot will probably be most useful. Otherwise, the root locus shows very important information with respect to behavior in the right half plane. Try to meet specifications with a simple controller of the lead lag PID variety. Do not overlook feed forward of the disturbances. Consider the effect of sensor noise. Step six, probably the most important step. Consider modifying the plant itself for improved closed loop control. Based on the simple control design, evaluate the source of the undesirable characteristics of system performance. Reevaluate the specifications, the physical configuration of the process, and the actuator and sensor selections considering the pre preliminary design. Return to step one if improvement seems necessary or feasible. It may be much easier to meet specifications by altering the process than to meet them by control strategies alone. Consider all parts of the design, not only the control logic, to meet the specifications in the most effective way. Step seven, make a trial pole placement design based on optimal control or other criteria. If the trial and error compensators do not give entirely satisfactory performance, consider a design based on optimal control. Select the location for your control poles that balance system performance and control effort. Select the location for the estimator poles that represent a compromise between sensor and process noise. Plot the corresponding open loop frequency response and the root locus to evaluate the stability margins of this design and its robustness to parameter changes. Compare this optimal design with the transform method design and select the better of the two. Step eight, build a computer model and simulate the performance of the design. After reaching the best compromise among process modification, actuator and sensor selection, and controller design choice, run a simulation of the system. Include important nonlinearities, parasitic effects, and parameter variations you expect to find during operation. Design iteration should continue until the simulation confirms acceptable stability and robustness. As the design progresses, more complete and detailed models, truth models, will be used. Digital control implementation should be considered. If the performance is not satisfactory, return to step one and repeat. Consider modifying the plant itself for improved closed loop control. Step nine. Build a prototype and test it. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. Simulation without experimental verification is at best questionable and at worst useless. At this point, you verify the quality of the model, discover unexpected effects, and consider ways to improve the design. Implement the controller using an embedded software hardware. Tune the controller if necessary. After these tests, you may want to reconsider the sensor, actuator, and process and return to step one. This outline is an approximation of good practice. One very important consideration, step six, was for changing the plant itself to make the control problem easier and provide maximum closed loop performance. 
In many cases, proper plant modifications can provide additional damping or increase the stiffness. Change in mode shapes, reduction of system response to disturbances, reduction of Coulomb friction, change in thermal capacity or conductivity, and so on. Designing the system and throwing it over the wall to the control group is inefficient and flawed. System design and control design must be done simultaneously. Block diagrams and loading effects. A block diagram of a system is a pictorial representation of the functions performed by each component and of the flow of signals. It depicts the interrelationships that exist among the various components. It is easy to form the overall block diagram for the entire system by merely connecting the blocks of the components according to the signal flow. It is then possible to evaluate the contribution of each component to the overall system performance. A block diagram contains information concerning dynamic behavior, but it does not include any information on the physical construction of the system. Many dissimilar and unrelated systems can be represented by the same block diagram. The block diagram of a given system is not unique. A number of different block diagrams can be drawn for a system depending on the point of view of the analysis. Blocks can be connected in series only if the output of one block is not affected by the next following block. If there are any loading effects between components, it is necessary to combine these components into a single block. Shown are some rules of block diagram algebra. On the left column, the original block diagram, and on the right column, the equivalent block diagram. Note entry number five. On the left, the original block diagram shows a negative feedback control system, where G1 is the element in the forward path, and G2 is the element in the feedback path. And note we have negative feedback. The overall transfer function for this negative feedback control system, which is the output B over the input A, is equal to the product of the elements in the forward path, which is G1, divided by 1 plus the product of the elements in the loop, which is G1, G2. So if A is the input and B is the output, then the transfer function is G1 over 1 plus G1 times G2. The unloaded transfer function is an incomplete component description. A complete component description relates the variables whose product is power at the input port to the variables whose product is power at the output port. And that is a matrix description. To properly account for interconnection effects, one must know three component characteristics the unloaded transfer function of the upstream component, the output impedance of the upstream component, and the input impedance of the downstream component. Only when the ratio of the output impedance, Z sub O, over the input impedance, Z sub I, is small compared to one over the frequency range of interest, does the unloaded transfer function give an accurate description of interconnected system behavior. In this diagram, G1 and G2 are unloaded transfer functions. If we want to represent the overall ratio of the output Y to the input U, 
we can simply multiply G1 and G2. If we assume that G2 is unloaded, that would be correct. But G1 clearly is not unloaded, as G2 will draw energy from G1 and hence load G1. So we can still use G2 as an unloaded transfer function, but G1 must be replaced by G1, the unloaded transfer function, times this ratio. The ratio of 1 over 1 plus the output impedance of G1 divided by the input impedance of G2. That then gets multiplied by G2, the unloaded transfer function, assuming that nothing is connected to G2 downstream. This then gives the complete, accurate input-output relationship between Y and U. And we can see that only if this ratio, the output impedance of G1 divided by the input impedance of G2, of, of G2 is much, much smaller than 1, which makes the denominator in that case 1, only in that case, over some frequency range of interest, can we represent the overall transfer function between Y and U as simply G1 times G2. Because in that case, this ratio, this term here, then reduces to simply 1. In general, loading effects occur because when analyzing an isolated component, that is one with no other component connected at its output, we assume no power is being drawn at this output location. When we later decide to attach another component to the output of the first, the second component does withdraw some power, violating our earlier assumption and thereby invalidating the analysis, the transfer function based on this assumption. When we model chains of components by simple multiplication of their individual transfer functions, we assume that loading effects are either not present, have been proven negligible, or have been made negligible using buffer amplifiers. Let's consider an example, the RC low pass filter. Here is a schematic of the resistor capacitor low pass filter. At the input port, I have my input voltage and input current. Its product is power. At the output port, I have output voltage and output current. Its, pa its product is power. A complete description of this RC low pass filter relates voltage and current in to voltage and current out. We do this by applying Kirchhoff's current law and Kirchhoff's voltage law to our, our RC circuit. When I do that, these equations result. Putting these equations in matrix form should gives me this result. And you can see that this relates voltage and current in to voltage and current out. This is the complete then component description of this RC low pass filter. If I now assume that the RC low pass filter is unloaded, and that is that I out is zero, which means in the matrix representation here, I out is zero, I then can get the ratio between E in and E out, as E in equals RC D plus 1 times E out minus R times I out, but I out equals 0, and so the ratio of E out to E in when I out equals 0 is 1 over RC D plus 1, where D is the differential operator representing derivative. In block diagram form, we write it as shown here, E in and E out, and in the block, we show the mathematical transfer function, 
in this case, the unloaded transfer function, since we're assuming that I out to zero, no power is being drawn from this component downstream. If I now connect two RC low pass filters in series, assuming they are identical, I have one RC low pass filter, and then I connect the second identical RC low pass filter to it. Here is the second one. A complete description of these two RC filters in series would relate voltage and current in, whose product is power, to voltage and current out, whose product is power. Even if I assume that this, this component made up of two RC low pass filters in series is unloaded, that is that I out equals zero, I cannot simply multiply the unloaded transfer function of a single RC low pass filter with another identical unloaded transfer function of a single RC low pass filter. In other words, the overall transfer function between E out and E in is not one over RCD plus one squared. The reason for this is that even though I out is zero, which means meaning this, this series component of two RC low pass filters is unloaded, the second RC low pass filter loads the first RC low pass filter. Current is drawn from the upstream component into the downstream component. So I cannot use for this upstream component the unloaded transfer function. That then invalidates what I have written here, hence the word no. To obtain the overall transfer function between voltage in and voltage out, I need to write the complete matrix representation relating voltage in and current in to voltage out and current out. And I do that by simply using the matrix representation for a single RC low pass filter, and then use it again for the second identical RC low pass filter. Multiplying these two matrices together gives me this result. Now if I assume that I out is equal to zero here, E in is then equal to this term times E out minus this term times I out, but I out equals zero. So the overall transfer function of E out over E in is given by this expression. So this then represents the complete input output transfer function for the two RC low pass filters in series, where the second RC low pass filter is unloaded, meaning that I out equals zero. Continuing with this example, I have my RC low pass filter with my complete component description. E in, I in, related to E out, I out, with this two by two matrix. I know that I out, when I out equals zero, the RC low pass filter is unloaded and the unloaded transfer function E out over E in equals one over RC D plus one, defining RC as tau the time constant. I can write that as one over tau D plus one where D is the differential operator. Using this matrix representation, I can write expressions for the output impedance, which is defined as E out over I out with E in equal to zero. This can be then evaluated using the matrix representation with this result. The input impedance is defined as E in over I in with I out equals zero. 
using the matrix representation, I can evaluate that expression with this result. Impedance is always voltage over current, voltage over current, voltage over current. At the output port, the output impedance is E out over I out with the condition on the input port that the input voltage is zero. The input impedance is voltage in over current in with the condition at the output port that I out equals zero. I can now make use of that result by reevaluating my two RC low pass filters connected in series. We've already noted that for the downstream RC low pass filter, if I assume nothing is connected to it, I out equals zero, and the unloaded transfer function is a good representation of that RC low pass filter. However, the upstream RC low pass filter is loaded by the downstream low pass filter. So I cannot use the unloaded transfer function to represent the upstream low pass filter. So this is incorrect. While I can use the unloaded transfer function for the downstream component, I cannot use the unloaded transfer function for the upstream component. I must modify that term using this ratio of one over one plus the output impedance of one divided by the input impedance of two. If I make the substitutions from the previous slide into this expression here and simplify, I get exactly the same result as I did by multiplying the matrices. So we see that only if Z out one is much, much less than Z in two, for some frequency range of interest, will loading effects be negligible. Shown is a generalized block diagram of a feedback or closed loop control system using the commonly accepted nomenclature. G represents the plant or process to be controlled. C is the controlled variable. The two inputs to the plant or process are M, the manipulated input, and D, the disturbance input. They are summed together by the summing junction. The controlled variable is measured using the feedback element H. H is typically a sensor or some sensor system. C can be contaminated by noise N and represented here by the summing junction. The feedback signal is given by B. It is the output of our feedback element. The desired value of C is V, which is our input to the entire feedback control system. A represents the reference input element and could perform a function such as input filtering or command compensation or simply some numerical conversion. R is the reference input. The goal is to have C track V. R minus B, the reference input minus the feedback signal, as shown by the summing junction, results in the signal E, which is defined as the actuating signal. It is not the error. The error is V minus C, and the error and E equals the error only in the case when A, the reference input element, is one, and H, the feedback element, is one. When that is the case, then E, the actuating signal, is in fact the error V minus C. This then represents the generalized block diagram for a feedback control system, where the elements in the blocks are the transfer functions, the mathematical representation of the actual elements, hardware elements in our system, 
and the arrows represent the signals between those elements. S is the Laplace variable and is identical for, for us to the differential operator D. So everything in this diagram is algebraic. Earlier block diagrams have been of a general functional nature. Now it is appropriate to begin using the working operational block diagrams necessary for actual system design and analysis. These use the transfer function concept, which allows the block diagram to communicate the numerical details of component and system behavior. The figure identifies the basic functional components from which all feedback systems are built. Two types of quantities require a definition, signals and systems. Signals are the physical variables, for example, voltage, pressure, temperature, that flow from one system component to another. Systems are the hardware components that perform the necessary operations. System descriptions consist of transfer functions, A of S, G of S, etc., which are shorthand graphic means of stating the component's differential equation. Note here that S is the Laplace variable, identical to D, our differential operator, is the algebraic representation of the component's differential equation. Signal V is the desired value of the control variable C with the same units as C. V may or may not exist as an actual physical quantity. The fact that signals V and R, the reference input element, need not be the same quantity is one reason the standard diagram provides the transfer function A of S, the reference input element. The reference input element can, when necessary, perform a simple function, for example, an algebraic conversion or a more sophisticated function, for example, command compensation or noise filtering. The summing junction represents the comparison E equals R minus B of the reference input with the feedback signal B. The summing junction cannot change the units of R and B. Therefore, R, B, and E always have the same dimensions. The feedback element H is often a sensor for measuring C but its functions sometimes include more than simple measurement. Therefore, feedback element is used rather than sensing element for its name. System error is logically defined as B minus C. Therefore, actuating signal is a more appropriate term for E, since E is equal to V minus C only if A equals H equals one, which is sometimes true, but often not true. GC represents the control elements containing the functions of both controller and actuator. G represents the control system elements or the process plant to be controlled. Control variable C is influenced by both manipulated variable M and disturbance D. Since the effect on C of D and M would in general be different, the path from D to C is often provided with a disturbance input element transfer function, not shown in this diagram, allowing complete independent specification of C over D and C over M relationships. This transfer function is not system components intentionally added by the designer to allow the disturbance entry to the system, but rather the necessary modeling of the unavoidable effect of D on C. The same applies to the sensor disturbance input N. The figure defines the basic types of signals and components necessary for description of any feedback control system. 
However, it must be adapted to the needs of each specific design. For example, disturbances may enter the system at several locations, not just at the process or sensor. This is easily accommodated by providing suitable located summing junctions and defining disturbances with corresponding disturbance input elements. Finally, when we deal with a specific application, rather than the abstract generality of the figure, it is preferable to use standard signals as subscripts on symbols which relate more directly to the physical variables involved. For example, desired temperature value could be represented as T sub V and controlled variable as T sub C. Using our block diagram for a feedback control system, we can now write down expressions for the most commonly used transfer function. The open loop transfer function is defined as the ratio of the feedback signal B to the actuating signal E, and it's given by the product of the elements between those two signals, GC, G, H. This is the open loop transfer function. The feed forward transfer function is the transfer function between the actuating signal E and the controlled variable C. It's the product of GC and G. This is the forward path. There are three closed loop transfer functions that are of significant importance. The first is the transfer function between the control variable C and the reference input R. This is given by the product of the elements in the forward path between these two signals, GCG, over the quantity 1 plus the product of the elements in the closed loop, GCGH. The plus sign be, comes about from the fact that we have negative feedback. Another important transfer function is the transfer function between C and D. Again, following the rule, that transfer function is equal to the product of the elements in the forward path from D to C, which is just G, over one plus the product of the elements in the closed loop. G, C, G, H. A third important transfer function is given by the transfer function between C and N. N is the input, the noise, and C is the output. Again, using our rule, this transfer function is given as the product of the elements in the path between N and C, which is H, G, C, G, with a minus sign, divided by one plus the product of the elements in the closed loop, G, C, G, H. Here are the three closed loop transfer functions of significance, and here are the two open loop transfer functions, the open loop and the feed forward transfer functions that are also of significance. Here we see a two degree of freedom control system. We've already seen this in our introductory slides. G sub C1 is our feedback controller whose purpose is disturbance rejection and insensitivity to modeling inaccuracy or robustness. G C2 is a feed forward controller uh, whose goal is command following. This is a two degree of freedom control system where we're not relying on one controller, the feedback controller, to accomplish all the tasks that we want, including stabilization, disturbance rejection, robustness, and command following. The two degree of freedom system gives, as the name suggests, more degrees of freedom to accomplish our control system tasks. 
Sensitivity analysis. Consider the function y equals f of x. If the parameter x changes by an amount delta x, then y changes by the amount delta y. If delta x is small, delta y can be estimated from the slope dy dx as follows. Delta y equals the slope dy dx times delta x. The relative or percent change in y is delta y over y. It is related to the relative change in x as follows. Dividing both sides of the above expression by y, I have delta y over y equals dy dx times delta x over y. Or reorganizing the terms and adding x to both the numerator and denominator, I have x over y times dy dx equals delta x over x. So the per percent change in y is related to the percent change in x by this expression, x over y times dy dx. The sensitivity of y with respect to changes in x is given by the expression capital S with a subscript X and a superscript Y equals X over Y times dy dx, which can be written as dy over Y divided by dx over X. dy over Y is equal to the derivative of the natural log of Y, which is one over Y times dy. The derivative of the natural log of x is 1 over x times dx. So thus, delta y over y equals the sensitivity of y with respect to changes in x times delta x over x. Usually, the sensitivity is not constant. For example, the function y equals sine x has the sensitivity function as follows. The sensitivity of y with respect to changes in x is x over y times dy dx, or x over y times the derivative of sine x with respect to x, which is cosine x, which can be written as x cosine x over sine x, which is equal to x over the tangent of x. Consider the sensitivity of control systems to parameter variation and parameter uncertainty. A process represented by the transfer function g is subject to a changing environment, aging, ignorance of the exact values of the process parameters, and other natural factors that affect a control process. In the open loop system, all these errors and changes result in a changing and inaccurate output. However, a closed loop system senses the change in the output due to the process changes and attempts to correct the output. The sensitivity of a control system to parameter variations is of prime importance. Accuracy of a measurement system is affected by parameter changes in the control system components and by the influence of external disturbances. A primary advantage of a closed loop feedback control system is its ability to reduce the system sensitivity. Consider the closed loop system shown. Let the disturbance D equal zero. We have our plant G, our controller GC, our feedback element H, R is the reference input, B is the feedback signal, E is the actuating signal, M is the manipulated input to the plant, D is the disturbance input, which for this exercise we're setting to zero, C is your controlled variable. An open loop systems block diagram is given by the following. G is the plant, GC the controller, R the reference input, 
see the controlled variable. We see that C over R is just GCG. The system sensitivity is defined as the ratio of the percentage change in the system transfer function T to the percentage change in the process transfer function G for a small incremental change. The transfer function is C over R. In this case, that's equal to GCG. The sensitivity of T with respect to changes in G is given by the following expression, which is the partial derivative of T with respect to G times G over T. Let's apply this to the open loop system in the block diagram. For the open loop system, T, which is C over R, is equal to GCG. The sensitivity of T with respect to changes in G is given as the partial derivative of T with respect to G times the ratio of G to T. The partial derivative of T with respect to G is GC. Then G over T is G over GCG. And we see that this then simplifies to one. Consider a closed loop system. The transfer function for a closed loop system, C over R, is GCG over one plus GCGH. Evaluating the expression sensitivity of T with respect to changes in G, we need to take the derivative of T with respect to G and multiply it by G over T. If I do that, I get the following expression shown here, which simplifies to one over G sub C times the expression one plus G sub C G H. The sensitivity of the system may be reduced below that of the open loop system by increasing the product of G, C, G, and H over the frequency range of interest. The sensitivity of the closed loop system to changes in the feedback element H is given by the following. The closed loop transfer function is C over R, which is G, C, G over one plus G, C, G, H. The sensitivity of the closed loop transfer function T to changes in H is given by the expression the partial derivative of T with respect to H times H over T, which reduces to this expression here, minus GCGH over one plus GCGH. We see this is different than the previous expression, the sensitivity of T to changes in G in the numerator. The numerator was 1 for the previous case. Here it's minus GCGH. When GCGH is large, the sensitivity approaches unity, and the changes in H directly affect the output response. So use feedback components that will not vary with environmental changes or can be maintained constant. As the gain of the loop, GCGH is increased, the sensitivity of the control system to changes in the plant and controller decreases, but the sensitivity to changes in the feedback system, that is the measurement system, becomes minus one. Also, the effect of the disturbance input can be reduced by increasing the gain GCH, since the transfer function between the input disturbance D and the control variable C is given by this expression. Therefore, to summarize, make the measurement system very accurate and stable, increase the loop gain to reduce sensitivity of the control system to changes in plant and controller, increase the gain GCH to reduce the influence of external disturbances. In practice, G is usually fixed and cannot be altered. 
H is essentially fixed once an accurate measurement system is chosen, and most of the design freedom then is available with respect to G sub C only. It is virtually impossible to achieve all the design requirements simply by increasing the gain of GC. The dynamics of GC also have to be properly designed in order to obtain the desired performance of the control system. Very often we seek to determine the sensitivity of the closed loop system to changes in a parameter alpha within the transfer function of the system G. Using the chain rule we find the sensitivity of T to changes in alpha equals the sensitivity of T to changes in G times the sensitivity of G to changes in alpha. Very often the transfer function T is a fraction of the form numerator N over denominator D. Then the sensitivity to alpha where alpha zero is the nominal value is given by the following expression. The sensitivity of T to alpha is equal to the partial derivative of the natural log of T with respect to the natural log of alpha. And since T is the numerator over denominator N over D, the partial derivative of the natural log of T equals the partial derivative of the natural log of the numerator minus the partial derivative of the natural log of the denominator, both divided by the partial derivative of the natural log of alpha. And these are both evaluated at alpha zero, the nominal value. This then equals the sensitivity of the numerator with respect to changes in alpha minus the sensitivity of the denominator with respect to changes in alpha. How is negative feedback related to op amps? Well, op amps are almost exclusively used with negative feedback. Let's understand why. Here we see a basic feedback system. E sub in is the input voltage. E sub out is the output voltage. K is the gain in the forward path. Beta is the gain in the feedback path. Using our formula for block diagram reduction, we know that E out over E in is equal to the product of the elements in the forward path divided by one plus the product of the elements in the loop. So that equals K over one plus beta K. If the product of beta and K are much, much greater than one, we see that this reduces to one over beta. So in the case when the loop gain, K times beta, is much, much greater than one, E out over E in is equal to one over beta, where beta is the elements in the feedback path. Negative feedback is the process of coupling the output back in such a way as to cancel some of the input. This does lower the amplifier's gain, but in exchange it also improves other characteristics, most notably freedom from distortion and nonlinearity, flatness of response, or conformity to some desired frequency response, and predictability. In fact, as more negative feedback is used, the resultant amplifier characteristics become less dependent on the characteristics of the open loop, no feedback amplifier, and finally depend only on the properties of the feedback network itself. Operational amplifiers are typically used in this high loop gain limit with open loop voltage gain, no feedback, of a million or so. This is a diagram of an op amp in the non inverting op amp configuration. There are two inputs to the op amp the non inverting input and the inverting input, and there's one output. 
The op amp is an active device, so it has a plus voltage supply and a negative voltage supply. The golden rules for op amps with negative feedback are that the non-inverting input voltage is equal to the inverting input voltage and no current flows into the op amp. So if the non-inverting input voltage is E in, the inverting voltage input is also E in. I recognize that R2 and R1 form a voltage divider between E in and E out, and that E in equals R1 over R1 plus R2 times E out, or E out over E in equals R1 plus R2 over R1, which can be written as 1 plus R2 over R1. This is the well-known result for a non-inverting op amp in ideal behavior. I can represent this result using my feedback block diagram. K is the op amp open loop gain, which is very, very high. It's not very predictable, but the only thing we know is that it's very high, a million or so. Beta represents the elements in the feedback path. I know that E out over E in is equal to K over one plus K beta, which reduces to one over beta if K is very, very large. K is the open loop gain of the op amp, which is very, very large. So E out over E in will equal one over beta. And beta is then R1 over R1 plus R2, which is E in over E out. So we see that the behavior of the op amp in this non-inverting op amp configuration of negative feedback reduces to one over beta, where beta are the rely on the elements that surround the op amp, R1 and R2, and not on the op amp behavior itself, as long as the gain of the op amp is very, very large, which it always is. So this shows you how negative feedback is used in an op amp to achieve the same advantages for the op amp system as are achieved in a feedback control system. Instability in feedback control systems. We've already stated that open loop systems are almost always stable, where, whereas feedback control systems can sometimes become unstable. All feedback systems can be unstable if improperly designed. In all real world components, there is some kind of lagging behavior between the input and output. And this is characterized by time constants and first order systems and undamped natural frequencies in second order systems. Instantaneous response is impossible in the real world. So instability in a feedback control system results from an improper balance between the strength of corrective action and the system dynamic lags. Let's give an example of this type of behavior. Consider the following physical situation. I want to keep the fluid level in a tank within a desired range called the error E dead space. A pump can provide a constant volume flow rate M either plus into the tank or minus out of the tank. The tank is located in an equipment room. It has a constant cross-sectional area A the height of fluid in the tank is designated by the letter C. The fluid is incompressible, so I can talk about volume flow rates rather than mass flow rates as density of the fluid is a constant. 
The volume of fluid in the tank is the cross-sectional area A times the height of fluid in the tank C. I want to maintain the level of fluid in the tank at a certain height, C, with a tolerance of plus or minus one half the error dead space. The pump is a three position pump. I can provide a constant volume flow rate in plus M, a constant volume flow rate out minus M, or I can simply turn the pump off. So I have three positions to choose from. The level of fluid in the tank is measured with a level sensor. It's measured exactly. However, the display for the level sensor is at a physical distance from the equipment room. It's located in the control room. And to read the level sensor, the operator has to walk from the equipment room to the control room. This takes time. The time is delta t, t is time. This we call the transmission delay. The system is capable of stable behavior or unstable behavior, and it all has to do with a balance between the transmission delay and the strength of corrective action. The strength of corrective action is a combination of the volume flow rate, m, which is either plus or minus and is constant, but can be varied. And the cross-sectional area of the tank A, which here is constant. However, if the cross-sectional area of, of the tank A is very, very large, then it takes quite a bit of volume flow rate to change the level of fluid in the tank. If the cross-sectional area of the tank is very, very small, even a modest volume flow rate will change the level of fluid in the tank very rapidly. So the strength of corrective action is a combination of M and one over A, the cross-sectional area. We will find that if the transmission delay delta T is large, but the volume flow rate is small, stable behavior will result in this control system. If the transmission delay is small, but the volume flow rate is large, this will also result in a stable behavior for the level, fluid level control system. However, if there is an imbalance between the transmission delay and the strength of corrective action represented by the volume flow rate M, meaning that if delta T is large and M is also large, we will see that this will lead to unstable behavior of my fluid level control system. Here is the tank with cross-sectional area A, height C, constant volume flow rate M, either into the tank or out of the tank, and my error dead space. So there's a tolerance of plus or minus one half the error dead space. The liquid level C in a tank is manipulated by controlling the volume flow rate M by means of a three position on off controller with error dead space E sub DS, error dead space. The transfer function one over AS, where S is the Laplace variable, which is equivalent to the differential operator D, between M and C represents conservation of volume between the volume flow rate and the liquid level. Conservation of volume says volume flow rate into the tank or out of the tank must equal the rate of change of the volume of fluid in the tank. So M must equal the area A times the time rate of change of the height of fluid in the tank, or dc dt. This leads to a transfer function between C and M of 1 over AS, where S is the Laplace variable, which is equivalent to the differential operator. The liquid level sensor measures C perfectly 
but with a data transmission delay, tau dead time, as we've explained. Here is the picture of my tank again with cross-sectional area A, which is constant, incompressible fluid in the tank, density is constant. Conservation of volume says that the volume flow rate, the net volume flow rate into the tank equals the change of volume of fluid in the tank, which is the cross-sectional area A, which is constant, times the time rate of change of the height of fluid in the tank, dc dt. Using the differential operator, this is A times capital D times C, or C over M is equal to 1 over AD or 1 over AS. M is the volume flow rate in meters cubed per second, and as we've said, plus M, minus M, or zero are the three possibilities. We'll set the error dead space to be 0.2 meters. Tau dead time, this is in seconds. This is the time delay in transmitting the fluid level measurement to the controller. The objective is to fill the tank to the desired level C, plus or minus one half the error dead space, and then stop. Here is a block diagram of my liquid level control system. Here is my process. M is the constant volume flow rate, either into the tank or out of the tank. C is the height of fluid in the tank, K over D, where K is 1 over A, D is the differential operator, represents the conservation of volume in the tank. The volume flow rate into the tank must equal the rate of change of volume within the tank, as shown by this equation. Using the differential operator D, my transfer function then becomes C over M is 1 over A times D, or K over D, where K is 1 over A. The height of fluid in the tank is transmitted with a delay, tau dead time, to the pump controller. If I desire to raise the fluid level in the tank to a new level, my reference input is a step command where R sub S represents the new level of fluid in the tank. The feedback signal B is the same as the height of fluid in the tank, however, it's delayed by the dead time. So R minus B represents the error, which is E. E is normally the actuating signal, but in this case, it actually represents the error between the desired value and the actual value, because B is the same as C, except it's delayed. This is my controller. It's a three-position on-off controller. If the error is within the error dead space, then the pump is off. If the error is positive and outside the error dead space, the pump will put fluid into the tank. If the error is negative and outside the error dead space, the pump will take fluid out of the tank. This is my three position on-off controller. As we've said, B is the feedback signal, E is the actuating signal, in this case it is the error, uh, R minus C. R is the reference input, R sub S is the step reference input. M is the manipulated input, which is the volume flow rate from the pump. C is the control variable, which is the height of fluid in the tank. To create this block diagram in Simulink, I use my transfer function block to represent the plant with the transfer function 1 over A divided by S. The output is my height of fluid in the tank C, which gets fed back through a transport delay to my summing junction. The step input is the new desired level of fluid in the tank. It's a step input. 
the difference between what I want and what the actual fluid height is with the delay is determined by the summing junction and this signal then represents the error. There is no three position on off controller in Simulink so I represent that or create that using two blocks. The dead zone block simply says that whatever comes in goes out unless it's in the dead zone. If it's in the dead zone the output is zero. If it's outside the dead zone positive it comes out positive. If it's outside the dead zone negative, it comes out negative. This is simply a dead zone block. But my three position on off controller says that if it's outside the dead zone, I get either positive M or negative M for my volume flow rate. The sign block takes the input. If the input is zero, I get zero. If it's positive, I get a one. If it's negative, I get a minus one. However, the volume flow rate, if I'm outside the dead zone positive is plus M, and if I'm outside the dead zone negative should be minus M, not plus one or minus one. So I multiply that by a gain block with M as my volume flow rate being the gain. This then is my simulink block diagram for my liquid level control system. I will leave the area of fluid in the tank to be constant and the error dead space to be constant. What I will vary is the time delay or transport delay and the volume flow rate. We will see that for a volume flow rate of three, and a dead time or delay time, transport delay of 0.1 seconds, I will get stable behavior. If I raise the volume flow rate to a level to a value of five and also increase the time delay to 0.2 seconds, I will see my behavior becomes unstable. So we will see that instability in a feedback control system results from an improper balance between the strength of the corrective action, here is a combination of both M and one over A, although one over A is a constant and M is what I'm varying, and the system dynamic lags, here represented by the transport delay. In the first simulation, with a value of M equal to three, A constant at value of two, the delay time equal to 0.1 seconds, I see that in order to raise the um, level of fluid in the tank to a height of three uh, with a plus or minus 0.1 um, tolerance, 0.1 meter tolerance, the error dead space is 0.2 meters, I see what happens. Since the level of fluid in the tank is below the desired level, I start from an empty tank, um, the pump is turned on. So I'm plotting here the height of fluid in the tank on the vertical axis, time on the horizontal axis, and the signal M, uh, I multiply by 0.1 and plot that also here on the vertical axis. I do that so I can plot both the height of fluid in the tank and also the volume flow rate on the same graph. So I see that initially, since the height uh, C, actual height, is below the desired level, um, but because of the transmission delay, I see the signal B. So since B is below the desired level, the pump is on. And the pump doesn't get turned off until the signal B crosses the bottom of the, the dead zone. Ideally, if there were no transmission delay, I would turn the pump off when the green line, the C signal, crosses the bottom of the dead zone. 
but because of the delay, uh, I turn the pump off when the signal B reaches the bottom of the dead zone. Since there's a balance between the strength of corrective action and the time delay, the actual height is still within the dead zone. And so I then have stable behavior and I've raised the level of fluid in the tank to an acceptable level and it remains constant and the pump is turned off. This is stable operation. However, if there is an imbalance between the strength of corrective action and the time delay, as represented by this increase in the value of the volume flow rate to five, and an increase in the time delay to 0.2, we can see what happens. Ideally, as I turn the pump on, because the liquid level in the tank starts out at zero, ideally I would turn the pump off when the green signal line C crosses the bottom of the dead zone. But because of the time delay, I don't turn off the pump until the signal B crosses the bottom of the uh, dead zone. But by that time, the actual height of fluid in the tank has exceeded the dead zone and is now too high. The pump is turned off while the signal B is within the dead zone. And then the pump is turned on when I see that the signal B is now above the dead zone. So we see that the result is a cyclic behavior where I fill the tank above the dead zone, then remove fluid and bring the level below the dead zone, and it results in a constant uh, oscillation, constant frequency, and constant amplitude. This is unstable behavior and results from an imbalance between the strength of corrective action, here the volume flow rate M, and the time delay uh, here represented by tau dead time, uh, 0.2 seconds. Let's talk more formally about stability and performance. If a system in equilibrium is momentarily excited by command and or disturbance inputs, and those inputs are then removed, the system must return to equilibrium if it is to be called absolutely stable. If action persists indefinitely after excitation is removed, the system is judged absolutely unstable. If a system is stable, how close is it to becoming unstable? Relative stability indicators are gain margin and phase margin. If we want to make valid stability predictions, we must include enough dynamics in the system model so that the closed loop system differential equation is at least third order. An exception to this rule involves systems with dead times where instability can occur when the dynamics, other than the dead time itself, are zero, first, or second order. The analytical study of stability becomes a study of the stability of the solutions of the closed loop system's differential equations. A complete and general stability theory is based on the locations in the complex plane of the roots of the closed loop system characteristic equation stable systems having all their roots in the left half plane. Here we show a plot in the complex plane, horizontal axis is the real axis, the vertical axis is the imaginary axis, of the roots of a closed loop system characteristic equation. On the imaginary axis, if we have a root at the origin, that corresponds to a constant response. Complex conjugate roots on the imaginary axis result in a sinusoidal oscillation that neither decays nor grows. The higher the roots are along the imaginary axis, the higher the frequency. Any root in the right half plane, if it's on the real axis, results in an exponential growth. The 
farther the root is to the right on the real axis, the faster the exponential growth. A complex conjugate pair of roots in the right half plane results in a sinusoid that grows without bound. The farther to the right, the faster it grows, the farther it is up the imaginary axis, the higher the frequency of the sine wave. So any roots in the right half plane or on the imaginary axis or at the origin are unstable by our definition. For stable behavior, all the roots need to be in the left half of the complex plane. Any roots on the negative real axis will result in exponential decay. The farther to the left on the negative real axis, the faster the decay. Any roots in the left half plane, complex conjugate roots, will result in a sinusoid that decays exponentially. The higher the sinusoid, the higher the roots are on the imaginary axis, the higher the frequency, the farther to the left the roots are in the left half plane, the faster the decay. So for stable behavior, the roots of the closed loop system characteristic equation must all lie in the left half plane. Results of practical use to engineers are mainly limited to linear systems with constant coefficients, where an exact and complete stability theory has been known for a long time. Exact general results for linear time variant and nonlinear systems are non-existent. Fortunately, the linear time invariant theory is adequate for many practical systems. For nonlinear systems, an approximation technique called the describing function technique has a good record of success. Digital simulation is always an option, and while no general results are possible, one can explore enough typical inputs and system parameter values to gain a high degree of confidence and stability for any specific system. There are two general methods of determining the presence of unstable roots without finding their numerical values. They are the Routh stability criterion. This method works with the closed loop system characteristic equation in an algebraic fashion. And the Nyquist stability criterion. This method is a graphical technique based on the open loop frequency response polar plot. Both methods give the same results, a statement of the number, but not the specific numerical values of unstable roots. This information is generally adequate for design purposes. We will talk about the route stability criterion in detail in this presentation. We will delay talking about the Nyquist stability criterion until we cover the single input, single output MATLAB tool in the next presentation. This theory predicts excursions of infinite magnitude for unstable systems. Since infinite motions, voltages, temperatures, etc., require infinite power supplies, no real world system can conform to such a mathematical prediction. Casting possible doubt on the validity of our linear stability criterion since it predicts an impossible occurrence. What happens is that oscillations, if they are to occur, start small under conditions favorable to and accurately predicted by the linear stability theory. Then they start to grow, again following the exponential trend predicted by the linear model. Gradually, however, the amplitudes leave the region of accurate linearization, and the linearized model, together with all its mathematical predictions, loses validity. Since solutions of the now nonlinear equations are usually not possible analytically, 
we must now rely on experience with real systems and or nonlinear computer simulations when explaining what really happens as unstable oscillations build up. First, practical systems often include overrange alarms and safety shutoffs that automatically shut down operation when certain limits are exceeded. If certain safety features are not provided, the system may destroy itself, again leading to a shutdown condition. If safe or destructive shutdown does not occur, the system usually goes into a limit cycle oscillation, an ongoing non-sinusoidal oscillation of fixed amplitude. The waveform, frequency, and amplitude of limit cycles is governed by nonlinear math models that are usually analytically unsolvable. Most of our discussion of performance will involve rather specific mathematical performance criteria, whereas the ultimate success of a controlled process generally rests on economic considerations, which are difficult to calculate. This rather nebulous connection between the technical criteria used for system design and the overall economic performance of the manufacturing unit results in the need for much exercise of judgment and experience in decision making at the higher management levels. Control system designers must be cognizant of these higher level considerations, but they usually employ rather specific and relatively simple performance criteria when evaluating their designs. The Routh criterion tells us whether any of the roots of a polynomial are in the right half of the complex plane. You may ask why we need this Routh criterion. If MATLAB can solve for the roots of a polynomial of any order, the answer is partly historical. In the days before there were computers, the Routh criterion was very valuable for determining whether a closed loop system was stable or not. However, even today it is valuable as if the polynomial has a parameter for which we want to know the range of values such that the roots of the polynomial are all in the left half plane, uh, the Routh criterion still has value. So let me explain to you how we construct the Routh array and apply the Routh stability criterion. The Routh criterion tells us to first arrange the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial into the following array. The coefficients are designated by the letter A with the subscripts n, n minus one, n minus two. A sub n represents the coefficient of the highest order term in the polynomial. We then form a third row, b1, b2, b3, using the formulas represented below. When the third row has been completed, a fourth row is formed from the second and third in the same fashion as the third was formed from the first and second. This is continued until no more rows and columns can be formed, giving a triangular sort of array. If the numbers become cumbersome, their size may be reduced by multiplying any row by any positive number. If one of the a's is zero, it is entered as a zero in the array. Although it is necessary to form the entire array, its evaluation depends always on only the first column. Routh's criterion states that the number of roots not in the left half plane is equal to the number of changes of algebraic sign in the first column. Thus, a stable system must exhibit no sign change in the first column. The Routh criterion does not distinguish between real and complex roots, nor does it give the specific numerical values of the unstable roots. 
Although the complete Routh procedure gives a correct result in every case, two special situations are worth memorizing as shortcuts. If the original system characteristic equation itself shows any sign changes, there is really no point in carrying out the Routh procedure. The system will always be unstable. If there are any gaps, zero coefficients in the characteristic equation, the system is always unstable. Note, however, that a lack of gaps or sign changes is a necessary, but not a sufficient condition for stability. Although not of much practical significance, since they rarely occur in practical problems, two special cases can occur mathematically, and I include them here for completeness. The first case, a term in the first column is zero, but the remaining terms in its row are not all zero causing a division by zero when forming the next row. In the second case, all terms in the second or any further row are zero, giving the indeterminate from zero divided by zero. This indicates pairs of equal roots with opposite signs located either on the real axis or on the imaginary axis. The solution for these two special cases is as follows. For case A, substitute 1 over x for s in the characteristic equation, then multiply by x to the nth power and form a new array. This method doesn't work when the coefficients of the original characteristic equation and the newly formed characteristic equation are identical. Another solution is to replace the zero by a very small positive number epsilon. Complete the array and then evaluate the signs in the first column by letting epsilon go to zero. Or another solution is to multiply the original polynomial by s plus one, which introduces an additional negative root and then form the Routh array. For case B, Form an auxiliary equation using coefficients from the row above, being careful to alternate powers of s. Differentiate the equation with respect to s to obtain the coefficients of the previously all zero row. The roots of the auxiliary equation are also roots of the characteristic equation. These roots occur in pairs. They may be imaginary, complex conjugates, or real, and equal in magnitude, with one positive and one negative. Thus, for a system to be stable, there must be no sign changes in the first column to ensure that there are no roots in the right half plane, and no rows of zeros to ensure that there are no pairs of roots on the imaginary axis. For example, one sign change in the first column and a row of zeros would imply one real root in the right half plane and one real root of the same magnitude in the left half plane. In addition to answering yes-no questions concerning absolute stability, the Routh criterion is often useful in developing design guidelines, helpful in making trade-off choices among system physical parameters. And this is the example that I will now show. Consider the transfer function g, function of s, given by this ratio of numerator to denominator. We're asked to determine the range of k for which the closed loop system is stable. I form the characteristic equation of the closed loop system, which is 1 plus g of s equals zero, which when I work out the algebra results in this polynomial. As you can see, I cannot let MATLAB solve for the roots of this polynomial until I assign a value to k. The question I have is, for what range of values of k does this characteristic equation represent stable behavior? I form the Routh array. But first, I check to see that there are no terms missing in my polynomial. 
I have an s to the fifth, an s to the fourth, s cubed, s squared, s to the first, s to the zero. All terms are present. There are also no sign changes in my polynomial. So that must mean that two plus k must be greater than zero, and k must be greater than zero. Otherwise, I would have sign changes, and there would be no point in going any further. I form the Routh array. The Routh array, the coefficients 1, 5.1, 2 plus k. In the second row, 1.9, 6.2, and 4k. Then I use my formulas to fill out the array for a1 and a2. B1, C1, 4K is the element in the array just by inspection and requires no computation. Once I've formed the Routh array, I look at the first column and I note that I cannot have any sign changes in that first column, otherwise, it would indicate roots in the right half plane or outside of the left half plane. So for stability, I find that A1 has to be greater than zero. A1 is equal to 1.837. B1 must be greater than zero. B1 is given by this term, which then leads me to the statement that K must be greater than minus 3.63, but I already know that K must be greater than zero. C1 has to be greater than zero. C1 is given by this expression which means that k has to be between these two values. And lastly, 4k has to be greater than zero, which says that k has to be greater than zero. So I see that to ensure that there are no roots outside of the left half plane, k must be, must be between the, the values zero and 0 0.78, which can be verified with a root locus plot or with a Nyquist diagram. It's appropriate now to talk about systems with time delay. To use the Routh stability criterion with a system with a time delay, the time delay would need to be approximated by a polynomial. We will see that the Nyquist stability criterion handles time delays exactly. But let's now talk about time delay. Time delays or dead times between inputs and outputs are very common in industrial processes and in engineering, economical, and biological systems. Transportation and measurement lags, analysis times, computation and communication lags all introduce dead times into control loops. Dead times are also used to compensate for model reduction, where high order systems are represented by low order models with delays. There are two major consequences. Time delays complicate the analysis and design of feedback control systems, and they make satisfactory control more difficult to achieve. Any delay in measuring, in controller action, in actuator operation, in computer computation, and the like, is called transport delay, or dead time and it always reduces the stability of a system and limits the achievable response time of the system. Let Q sub I of T equal the input to the dead time element. Q sub O of T is the output of the dead time element, and it equals the input of the dead time element delayed by an amount tau dead time times the function U, which is a step function, delayed by the dead time, tau dt. So u, the step function delayed by a time tau dt equals one when t is greater than the dead time and equals zero when t is less than the dead time. So if I draw a block diagram and I have my q in to my dead time block, q out is the same as q in except it is delayed 
by the amount of the dead time. In the theory for Laplace transforms, the Laplace transform of a function delayed by an amount a is equal to e to the minus a times s, where a is the Laplace variable, times the Laplace transform of the function f of t. This is one theorem of Laplace transforms. To represent the time delay in the time domain, the black diagram shows the input q sub i, the function of time, into a time delay block, gives me the output q sub o as a function of time. The output is the same as the input, except it's delayed by an amount tau dead time. In the frequency domain, capital Q sub I of S is the Laplace transform of the input. Q sub O of S is the Laplace transform of the output. And they're related by the function E to the minus tau dead time times S. This transfer function between the output and the input has a magnitude of one at all frequencies. Its magnitude is constant. And it has a phase angle that increases with frequency with a slope of minus omega times tau dead time. So we can see as the frequency increases, the phase lag of the dead time element increases linearly with frequency. Dead time approximations. The simplest dead time approximation can be obtained graphically or by taking the first two terms of the Taylor series expansion of the Laplace transfer function of a dead time element, tau dead time. So the transfer function is e to the minus tau dead time times s, which is approximately equal to 1 minus tau dead time times s, or in the time domain, q sub o is approximately equal to q sub i minus the tau dead time times the slope of q sub i with respect to time, or dq sub i dt. The accuracy of this approximation depends on the dead time being sufficiently small relative to the rate of change of the slope of q sub i of t. If q sub i of t were a ramp, constant slope, the approximation would be perfect for any value of tau dead time. When the slope of q sub i of t varies rapidly, only small tau dead times will give a good approximation. Here is the dead time graphical approximation. This line here represents q in. Q out is Q in delayed by an amount tau dead time. So the value of Q in at time t is this value here. The value of Q out delayed by an amount tau dead time is this value here. To approximate that, I draw a line tangent to Q in at time t. And then at tau dead time, the approximation for the output would be given by this point right here. Q out equals Q in minus tau dead time times the slope of Q in at time t. So you can see the, the difference in the actual value of the output and the graphical approximation uh, of the output value. A frequency response viewpoint gives a more general accuracy criterion. If the amplitude ratio and the phase of the approximation are sufficiently close to the exact frequency response curves of E to the minus tau dead time S, for the range of frequencies present in Q in of T, then the approximation is valid. The Pade approximants provide a family of approximations of increasing accuracy 
and complexity, the simplest two being the one shown here, Q out over Q in given by this expression, and then a more accurate Pade approximation, Q out over Q in given by this expression. Using a Taylor series expansion, we can write E to the minus tau S uh, by this expression here, which is what contributes to the Pade approximation. Graphically, I show the actual time delay on the phase angle graph of the Bode plots. Here we see dead time phase angle approximation comparison. This is the phase angle in degrees, and we see the exact time delay on this uh, logarithmic plot is shown by this curve. Uh, here the tau dead time is given a numerical value of 0 0.01, so I can plot it. The first approximate, Pade approximation, gives me this curve here. And the second Pade approximation, more accurate, gives me this curve. So over some range of frequencies, you need to decide which Pade approximation uh, is more reasonable to use given the frequency of operation range. For the Pade approximation, the transfer function is all pass. That is, the magnitude of the transfer function is one for all frequencies. The transfer function is non-minimum phase, that is, it has zeros in the right half plane. As the order of the approximation is increased, it approximates the low frequency phase characteristic with increasing accuracy. And we showed that from the graph on the previous slide. Another approximation with the same properties is shown here. Let's now talk about performance. What is the control system objective? Well, it's to have C follow the desired value V and ignore disturbances. Technical performance criteria must have to do with how well these two objectives are attained. Performance depends both on system characteristics and the nature of the desired value V, the disturbance D, and the noise N, shown as our basic linear feedback control system. The practical difficulty is that precise mathematical functions for the desired value, the disturbance, and the noise will not generally be known in practice. Therefore, the random nature of many practical commands and disturbances makes difficult the development of performance criteria based on the actual V, D, and N experienced by the real system. It is thus much more common to base performance evaluation on system response to simple standard inputs, such as steps, ramps, and sine waves. This approach has been successful for several reasons. In many areas, experience with the actual performance of various classes of control systems has established a good correlation between the response of systems to standard inputs and the capability of the systems to accomplish their required tasks. Design is much concerned with comparison of competitive systems. This comparison can often be made nearly as well in terms of standard inputs as for real inputs. Simplicity of form of standard inputs facilitates mathematical analysis, and experimental verification. For linear systems with constant coefficients, theory shows that the response to a standard input of frequency content adequate to exercise all significant system dynamics can then be used to find mathematically the response to any form of input. 
standard performance criteria may be classified as falling into two categories. Time domain specifications, this is response to steps, ramps, and the like. For example, step response criteria, rise time, peak time, percent overshoot, settling time, decay ratio, and steady state error. And frequency domain specifications. These are concerned with certain characteristics of the system frequency response. For example, bandwidth, peak amplitude ratio, gain margin, and phase margin. Both time domain and frequency domain design criteria generally are intended to specify one or the other of speed of response, relative stability, steady state errors. Both types of specifications are often applied to the same system to ensure that certain behavior characteristics will be obtained. All performance specifications are meaningless unless the system is absolutely stable. It is important to realize that because of model uncertainties, it is not merely sufficient for a system to be stable, but rather it must have adequate stability margins. Stable systems with low stability margins work only on paper. When implemented in real time, they are frequently unstable. The way uncertainty has been quantified in classical control is to assume that either gain changes or phase changes occur. Typically, systems are destabilized when either gain exceeds certain limits or if there is too much phase lag, that is, negative phase associated with unmodeled poles or time delays. The tolerances of gain or phase uncertainty are the gain margin and phase margin. What is neutral stability? If the closed loop transfer function of a system is known, which is usually not the case, one can determine the stability of the system by simply inspecting the denominator in facted form to observe whether the real parts are positive or negative. One can determine closed loop stability by evaluating the frequency response of the open loop transfer function and then performing a test on that response. This is the Nyquist stability test. It's a very valuable test, especially when the frequency response information, the data, is determined experimentally. All roots on the root locus have the following property. The magnitude of Kg equals one, and the angle of G is 180 degrees. At the point of neutral stability, the root locus conditions hold for S equal to J omega, where J is the square root of minus one, the imaginary number. The magnitude of Kg evaluated at S equal J omega equals one, and the angle of G evaluated at J omega equals 180 degrees. Thus, a Bode plot of a system that is neutrally stable, that is, with k defined such that a closed loop root falls on the imaginary axis, will satisfy these conditions. The Bode magnitude response corresponding to neutral stability passes through 1, that is 0 dB, at the same frequency at which the phase passes through 180 degrees. This leads then to our definition of stability margins. Two open loop performance criteria in common use to specify relative stability are gain margin and phase margin. The open loop frequency response is defined as B over E, where S is equal to I or J omega. One could open the loop by removing the summing junction at the RBE summing junction and just input a sine wave at E and measure the response at B. 
this is valid since B over E of I omega equals G1, G2, H, all evaluated at I omega. The utility of the open loop frequency response rests on the Nyquist stability criterion. The Nyquist stability test is very useful when we have experimental data, but when we have a model of our system, both the root locus plot and the Bode plots inform us about the absolute stability of our system. What is important here are the stability margins that need to be adequate in order for the real system when it is built to be able to function absolutely stable. The gain margin, abbreviated GM, and the phase margin, abbreviated PM, are in the nature of safety factors such that the open loop transfer function, B over E of I omega, stays far enough away from the point magnitude one with an angle of minus 180 degrees on the stable side. Gain margin is defined as the multiplying factor by which the steady state gain of the open loop transfer function B over E could be increased. Nothing else in B over E being changed so as to put the system on the edge of instability. That is B over E evaluated at S equal I omega passes exactly through the minus one point. This is called marginal stability. Phase margin is the number of degrees of additional phase lag, nothing else being changed, required to create marginal stability. And phase angle we know is equivalent to time delay. Both a good gain margin and a good phase margin are needed. Neither is sufficient by itself. Here we see a diagram that shows phase margin and gain margin. And we've said a system must have adequate stability margins. Both a good gain margin and a good phase margin are needed. The useful lower bounds are gain margin greater than 2.5 and a phase margin greater than 30 degrees. So we see here in the diagram the plot of the open loop Bode, Bode diagram, B over E. This is a polar plot where each point on this plot represents a magnitude and a phase angle. And the frequency at each point is implicit. When this plot crosses the unit circle, we can measure the angle that the line from the origin to that intersection point makes with the negative real axis. And this is called the phase margin. If we have phase lag, what will happen is that this plot will start to rotate. And this point here, the intersection point of the plot with the unit circle will rotate until at marginal stability, it goes through minus one. And after that, it will become absolutely unstable and therefore useless. This represents the phase margin, the amount of phase lag one can tolerate before the system goes to neutral or marginal stability. Phase margin is equivalent to time delay. So, this represents how much time delay you can tolerate before you go unstable. Now, if you increase the gain, what will happen to this plot is that it will not rotate, it will just expand outward. And if it expands outward enough to go through the point minus one, then what happens is you're at marginal stability by virtue of increasing the gain. This distance here from the imaginary axis to the intersection of the plot with the negative real axis, here it's shown as A, that distance 
In fact, it's reciprocal. One over A is what we call the gain margin because between zero and minus one, we're dealing with fractions. So for example, if this distance A were 0.5, then one over 0.5 is two. So you could increase the gain by a factor of two, which would put this point going through minus one, which would then be marginal stability. Another possible measure of gain and phase margins, that is a composite um, criterion, is called the vector margin, and it is the distance to the minus one point from the closest approach of the Nyquist plot. So here is that Nyquist plot, and we draw a circle around minus one that is tangent to this plot. And this distance here is called the vector margin. It's the closest distance to our plot from minus one. This is a single margin parameter and it removes all ambiguities in assessing stability that come from using gain margin and phase margin in combination. But the Nyquist plot gives us the gain margin and phase margin unambiguously, even when we have complex systems with multiple crossings of the negative uh, real axis. And lastly, here we see the Bode plot view of gain margin and phase margin. We see where the magnitude Bode plot crosses 0 dB or 1, and we see that then the phase angle, the difference between the phase angle and minus 180 degrees is our phase margin. And then when the phase angle becomes minus 180 degrees, we go up to the magnitude plot, and we see that the distance from the plot to zero dB is our gain margin. So gain margin and phase margin can be determined from our Bode plots and also from our Nyquist diagram. Sometimes the Bode plot information is confusing and even sometimes in error, but the Nyquist plot is unambiguous and should be checked for gain margin and phase margin whenever there is confusion um, by viewing the Bode plot. Consider the following design problem. Given a plant transfer function G2, find a compensator transfer function G1, which yields the following. Stable closed loop system, good command following, good disturbance rejection, insensitivity of command following to modeling errors, we call that performance robustness, stability robustness with unmodeled dynamics, sensor noise rejection. Without closed loop stability, a discussion of performance is meaningless. It is critically important to realize that the compensator is designed to stabilize a nominal open loop plant. Unfortunately, the true plant is different from the nominal plant due to unavoidable modeling errors. Knowledge of modeling errors should influence the design of the compensator. We assume here that the actual closed loop system is absolutely stable. Shown is the magnitude Bode plot for the open loop system. This is the desired shape for the open loop transfer function in order to achieve stable closed loop system, good command following, good disturbance rejection, insensitivity of command following to modeling errors, that is performance robustness, stability robustness with unmodeled dynamics, and sensor noise rejection. It can be shown that in order to accomplish these objectives, the open loop Bode plot should have high gain at low frequencies. These are frequencies for good command following, disturbance rejection, sensitivity reduction, and should have low gain at high frequencies, where sensor noise 
and unmodeled high frequency dynamics are significant. And at, at crossover, where the magnitude is zero dB, we need a smooth transition from the low frequency range to the high frequency range. That is a slope of minus 20 dB per decade near the gain crossover frequency, usually for a decade before and a decade after. This assures good stability margins for our closed loop system. And this applies to linear time invariant systems. Let's turn our attention to disturbance response. The focus up to now has been on command response. Disturbance response is also important, and in some applications, more important than command response. Disturbance response is more difficult to measure because disturbances are more difficult to produce than our commands. Both command response and disturbance response improve with high loop gains. A high proportional gain, Kp, provides a higher bandwidth and better ability to reject disturbances with high frequency content. A high integral control gain, K sub i, helps the control system reject lower frequency disturbances. Setting the integral control gain Ki high has a minimal effect on the command response Bode plots. K sub i is aimed at improving response to disturbances, not commands. In fact, the process of tuning K sub i is essentially to raise it as high as possible without significant impact on the command response. K sub i is not noticeable in the command response until it is high enough to cause peaking and instability. High K sub i provides unmistakable benefit in disturbance response. In addition, disturbance compensated feed forward control aids disturbance response by using measured or estimated disturbances to improve disturbance response. Sometimes disturbance response is referred to by its inverse, disturbance rejection or dynamic stiffness. Control systems need to have high dynamic stiffness, that is disturbance rejection and low disturbance response. Disturbances are undesirable inputs. We are concerned about a response to an input other than a command. A properly placed integrator will totally reject DC, that is static, disturbances. High tuning gains will help the system reject dynamic disturbance inputs, but those inputs cannot be rejected entirely. Here we see the disturbance D is applied just before plant. The control system cannot reject the disturbance perfectly because the disturbance is detected only after it moves the output. The controller cannot react until the system output has been disturbed. Disturbance response is defined as the response of the system output C to the disturbance D and that transfer function is given as G over one plus GCGH. One way to improve disturbance response is to use slow moving plants, that is large inertia, high capacitance, to provide low plant gains. Reduce G. This is a time proven technique. Large flywheel smooth motion, large inductors and capacitors, smooth voltage output. A second way to improve disturbance response is to increase the gains of the controller, GC. This is how integral gains grant systems perfect response to DC inputs. The gain of the ideal integrator at zero hertz is infinite, driving up the magnitude of the transfer function denominator and thus driving down the disturbance response. At other frequencies, unbounded gain is impractical. 
So AC disturbance response is improved with high gains, but not cured entirely. Dynamic stiffness is the inverse of disturbance response. It is a measure of how much force is required to move a system, as opposed to disturbance response, which is a measure of how much the system moves in the presence of a force. A system that is very stiff responds little to disturbances. Shown is a block diagram of a basic feedback control system. Let's explore disturbance response of this feedback control system. We will make G, the plant, an integrator, 1 over JS. GC, the controller, we will assign a proportional integral controller, PI control. H, the feedback element, we will make one, so we have unity feedback. The transfer function from D to C is the product of the elements in the forward path from D to C, which is G, over one plus the product of the elements in the loop, G, C, G, H. So C over D is G over one plus G, C, G, H. After making these three substitutions, my closed loop transfer function between the disturbance input and the controlled variable is S over JS squared plus KPS plus KPKI, where KP is the proportional gain, KI is the integral gain. J will affect disturbance response in the high frequency range. KP will affect the disturbance response in the mid-frequency range, and the product of KP and KI will affect the disturbance response in the low-frequency range. Here is my closed-loop transfer function, C over D, and here is the closed-loop Bode plot, magnitude and phase. For the assigned values of J equal to 0 0.002, KP equal to 0.58, KI equal to 58. And we can see what the disturbance response is at low frequency, mid frequency, high frequency. What happens if I increase J, increase KP, increase KI? Let's do that one after the other, increase each one by an order of magnitude. So I see in this series of plots that if I increase J by an order of magnitude, we see that the original plot in blue, and we see that at high frequency, now in green, the disturbance response is much, much less. If I increase KP by a factor of 10, in this case, I've switched the colors. Green is the original curve, and the blue is now with the new value of KP increased by an order of magnitude. We see the disturbance response has been reduced in both the mid-frequency range and in the low-frequency range. If I increase KI by a factor of 10 to 580, Again, now in this case, the blue is the original curve, and the green is now the new curve with the increased value of Ki. I see that it, its effect is in the low frequency range, and it reduces the disturbance response. So to summarize, here are some observations. Increasing the value of J reduces or improves the disturbance response in the higher frequencies. Disturbance response from the inertia improves as frequency increases. This is the one over JS term. In the medium frequency range, the one over KP term dominates. A large proportional gain helps in the medium frequencies. In the lowest frequency range, the S over KIKP term dominates. Larger proportional gain improves the low frequency disturbance response, as does larger integral gain. 
Remember that larger proportional gain allows larger integral gains. So increasing KP improves medium and low frequency disturbance response directly and indirectly helps low frequency disturbance response by allowing a larger integral control gain. Raising J improves the high frequency disturbance response directly, but improves sometimes the rest of the frequency spectrum indirectly by allowing a larger value of proportional control gain. Noise, resolution, and resonance may limit improvement. Now let's consider command feed forward control. The designer combines knowledge of the command and of the plant to improve command response. The command signal is processed and routed ahead of the controller directly to the power converter. The signal on the feed forward path avoids the delay associated with the control laws. Feed forward control calculates a best guess. It predicts the signal that should be sent to the power converter to produce the ideal response from the plant. Most of the power converter output can be generated by the feed forward path, leaving the control loop to provide only small corrections. Feed forward control requires knowledge of both plant and the power converter. Perfect knowledge of both provides ideal command response. Although perfect knowledge is impractical, being able to predict the operation of the plant and power converter to within an accuracy common for industrial controllers, usually plus or minus 20%, usually allows substantial improvement in command response. With feed forward control, the command response becomes less dependent on the control loop bandwidth. By using an aggressive feed-forward design, the command response can be improved by a factor of three or more. Here is our command-compensated feed-forward control. We have our basic feedback control, control loop, and we here we see the reference input, input to our feed-forward controller, and our feed-forward gain, and that gets summed with the output of our feedback controller. The closed loop transfer function can be shown to be C over R equal to KFGF plus KC, that entire quantity times G over one plus GCGH. In most cases, GF is chosen as the inverse of the plant, G inverse, with KF less than 1, usually between 0.5 and 0.8. With feed forward control, response is not limited by the controller gains. Also, because feed forward gains do not form a loop, they do not impair system stability. Systems with feed forward control typically respond much faster and with less overshoot than a non feed forward system. If we treat both the sensor H and power converter as ideal and desire a closed loop transfer function equal to one, then this can be satisfied with a choice of KF equal to one and GF equal to the inverse of the plant. Unfortunately, the power converter is limited by bandwidth and the feedback element may be filtered to reduce noise or may be delayed by sampling. Using full feed forward, that is KF equal to one, produces unacceptable performance. The attenuation and phase lag of non-ideal power conversion and feedback devices will cause a system with full feed forward to overshoot to aggressive commands. Reduce KF to eliminate the overshoot. 95% of the controllers used in the world today are proportional integral derivative controllers, PID. Let's first talk about proportional control. Virtually all controllers have a large proportional gain. 
While we will see that derivative gain can provide incremental improvements at high frequencies, and integral gain improves performance at lower frequencies, the proportional gain is the primary actor across the entire frequency range of operation. Here, the manipulating variable m is directly proportional to the actuating signal e. The corrective effort is made proportional to system error. Large errors engender a stronger response than do small ones. We can vary in a continuous fashion the energy and or material sent to the control process. Proportional control exhibits non-zero steady state errors for even the least demanding commands and disturbances. Why is this so? Suppose for an initial equilibrium operating point, xc equals xv, and steady state error is zero. Now ask xc to go to a new value, x v s. It takes a different value for the manipulated input m to reach equilibrium at the new x c. When the manipulated input m is proportional to the actuating signal e, a new m can only be achieved if e is different from zero, which requires that x c does not equal x v. Thus, there must be a steady state error. The differential equation for proportional control says that the manipulated input is proportional to the actuating signal, where the constant of proportionality is kp. m is the manipulated input to the plant, e is the actuating signal to the controller. Now consider integral control. When a proportional controller can use large loop gain and preserve good relative stability, system performance, including those on steady state error, may often be met. However, if difficult process dynamics such as significant dead times prevent use of large gains, steady state error performance may be unacceptable. When human process operators notice the existence of steady state errors, Due to changes in desired value and or disturbance, they can correct for these by changing the desired value, the set point, or the controller output bias until the error disappears. This is called manual reset. Integral control is a means of removing steady state errors without the need for manual reset. It is sometimes called automatic reset. In the time domain, the derivative of the manipulated input with respect to time equals the integral gain times the actuating signal, or the manipulated input to the plant equals k sub i times the integral with respect to time of the actuating signal. In transfer function form, m over e is equal to the integral gain divided by s. If the value of e is doubled, then the value of m varies twice as fast. For e equal to zero, m remains stationary. We have seen why proportional control suffers from steady state errors. We need a control that can provide any needed steady output within its design range, of course, when its input, the system error, is zero. Here we see a comparison of proportional and integral control. R is the reference input, B is the feedback signal, E is the actuating signal. M is the manipulated input to the plant. In the top diagram, KP is your proportional controller, and you see that M is proportional to E. In the second diagram, the controller is an integral controller. It integrates the actuating signal. So even when the actuating signal goes to zero, M, which is integrating, which is the output of the integration of the actuating signal, has a non zero value that's constant. In integral control has the undesirable side effects of reducing response speed and degrading stability. 
Although integral control is very useful for removing or reducing steady state errors, it has the undesirable side effect of reducing response speed and degrading stability. Why? Reduction in speed is most readily seen in the time domain, where a step input, which is a sudden change, to an integrator causes a ramp output, a much more gradual change. Stability degradation is most apparent in the frequency domain, using the Nyquist stability criterion, where the integrator reduces the phase margin by giving an additional 90 degrees of phase lag at every frequency, rotating the open loop curve, the B over E curve, toward the unstable region near the minus one point. Occasionally, an integrating effect will naturally appear in a system element, actuator or process, other than the controller. These gratuitous integrators can be effective in reducing steady state errors. Although controllers with a single integrator are most common, double, and occasionally triple integrators are useful for the more difficult steady state error problems, although they require careful stability augmentation. Conventionally, the number of integrators between E and C in the forward path has been called the system type number. In addition to the number of integrators, their location relative to disturbance injection points determines their effectiveness in removing steady state errors. In figure A, the integrator gives zero steady state error for a step command but not for a step disturbance. By, re by relocating the integrator as in figure B, either or both step inputs, V or U, can be canceled by M without requiring E to be non-zero. The observation then is that integrators must be located upstream from disturbance injection point if they are to be effective in removing steady state errors due to disturbances. Location is not significant for steady state errors caused by commands. Integral control can be used by itself or in combination with other control modes. Proportional integral control is the most common mode. Integral gain provides DC and low frequency stiffness. When a DC error occurs, the integral gain will move to correct it. The higher the gain, the faster the correction. Fast correction implies a stiffer system. But don't confuse DC stiffness with dynamic stiffness. A system can be quite stiff at DC and not stiff at all at high frequencies. Higher integral gains will provide higher DC stiffness but will not substantially improve stiffness at or above the loop bandwidth. PI controllers are more complicated to implement than P controllers. Saturation becomes more complicated as integral windup must be avoided. In analog controllers, clamping diodes must be added and in digital controllers, saturation algorithms must be coded. Integral gain can cause instability. In the open loop, the integral, with its 90 degrees of phase lag, reduces phase margin. In the time domain, the common result of adding integral gain is overshoot and ringing. As a result, larger integral gains usually reduce bandwidth. Lastly, derivative control. Proportional and integral control actions can be used as the sole effect in a practical controller, but the various derivative control modes are always used in combination with some more basic control law. This is because the derivative mode produces no corrective effect for any constant error, no matter how large, and therefore would allow uncontrolled steady state errors. One of the most important contributions of derivative control is in system stability augmentation. If absolute or relative stability is the problem, 
a suitable derivative control mode is often the answer. The stabilization or damping aspect, aspect can easily be understood qualitatively from the following discussion. Invention of integral control may have been stimulated by the human process operators' desire to automate their task of manual reset. Derivative control hardware may first have been devised as a mimicking of human response to changing error signals. Suppose a human process operator is given a display of system error E and has the task of changing manipulated variable M say with a control dial, so as to keep E close to zero. So we see here in the plot of E versus T, that at T1 and at T2, the actuating signal E is the same. But at T1, E is increasing, while at T2, E is decreasing. The engineer would not give the same corrective action at T1 as he or she would at T2. And derivative control would give no corrective action at T3. If you were the operator, would you produce the same value of M at T1 as at T2? The proportional controller would do exactly that. A stronger corrective effect seems appropriate at T1 and a lesser one at T2 since at T1, the error E is increasing, whereas at T2, the error is the same, but decreasing. The human eye and brain senses not only the ordinate of the curve, but also its trend or slope. Slope is clearly DEDT. So to mechanize this desirable human response, we need a controller sensitive to error derivative. Such a control can, however, not be used alone since it does not oppose steady state errors of any size, as at T3, thus a combination of proportional plus derivative control, for example, makes sense. The relation of the general concept of derivative control to the specific effect of viscous damping in mechanical systems can be appreciated from the figure below. Here an applied torque T tries to control position theta of an inertia J. The damper of torque on J behaves exactly like a derivative control mode in that it always opposes velocity d theta dt with a strength proportional to that derivative making motion less oscillatory. Derivatives of E, C, and almost any available signal in the system are candidates for a useful derivative control mode. First derivatives are most common and easiest to implement. The noise accentuating characteristics of derivative operations may often require use of approximate, that is low pass filtered, derivative signals. Derivative signals can sometimes be realized better with sensors directly responsive to the desired value, rather than trying to differentiate an available signal. In addition to stability augmentation, derivative modes may also offer improvements in speed of response and steady state errors. The derivative gain advances the phase of the loop by virtue of the 90 degrees phase lead of a derivative. Using derivative gain will usually allow the system responsiveness to increase, allowing the bandwidth to nearly double in some cases. Derivative gain has high gain at high frequencies. So while some derivative gain does help the phase margin, too much hurts the gain margin by adding gain at the phase crossover frequency, typical a high frequency. This makes the derivative gain difficult to tune. The designer sees overshoot improve because of increased phase margin, but a high frequency oscillation, which comes from reduced gain margin, becomes apparent. 
Derivatives are also very sensitive to noise. The derivative gain needs to be followed by a low pass filter to reduce noise content. However, the lower break frequency of the filter, the less benefit can be gained from the derivative gain. Proportional plus derivative control has the differential equation shown here. The manipulated input is proportional to the actuating signal with the constant of proportionality Kp and also proportional to the derivative of the actuating signal with the constant of proportionality Kd. The transfer function between E and M is then Kp plus Kd times S. Derivative control has an anticipatory character, however. It can never anticipate any action that has not yet taken place. Derivative control amplifies noise signals and may cause a saturation effect in the actuator. How is a PID controller implemented digitally? A digital controller differs from an analog controller in that the signals must be sampled and quantized. A signal to be used in digital logic needs to be sampled first, then the samples need to be converted by an analog to digital converter into a quantized digital number. Once the digital computer has calculated the proper next control signal value, this value needs to be converted into a voltage and held constant or otherwise extrapolated by a digital to analog converter in order to be applied to the actuator of the process. The control signal is not changed until the next sampling period. As a result of the sampling, there are more strict limits on the speed or bandwidth of a digital controller than on analog devices. A reasonable rule of thumb for selecting the sampling period is that during the rise time of the response to a step, the input to the discrete controller should be sampled approximately six times. By adjusting the controller for the effects of sampling, the sampling can be adjusted to two to three times per rise time. This corresponds to a sampling frequency that is 10 to 20 times the system's closed loop bandwidth. The quantization of the controller signals introduces an equivalent extra noise into the system. And to keep this interference at an acceptable level, the A to D converter usually has an accuracy of 10 to 12 bits. We will consider a simplified technique for finding a discrete that is sampled but not quantized equivalent to a given continuous controller. The method depends on the sampling period T sub S being short enough that the reconstructed control signal is close to the signal that the original analog controller would have produced. We also assume that the numbers used in the digital logic have enough accurate bits so that the quantization implied in the A to D and D to A processes can be ignored. Finding a discrete equivalent to a given analog controller is equivalent to finding a recurrence equation for the samples of the control, which will approximate the differential equation of the controller. The assumption is that we have the transfer function of an analog controller and wish to replace it with a discrete controller that will accept samples of the controller input, E, at discrete instance in time, from a sampler and using pass values of the control signal M at discrete instance in time, and present and pass values of the input E at discrete instance in time, will compute the next control signal to be sent to the actuator. Let's consider the PID controller as an example. The proportional integral derivative controller, PID, is the most widely used controller in use today. It can stabilize a system increase the speed of response of a system, and reduce steady state errors of a system. The differential equation says that the manipulated input is proportional to the actuating signal, proportional to the integral of the actuating signal, 
and proportional to the derivative of the actuating signal. Or in transfer function form, M is equal to KP plus KI over S plus KDS all times E. Consider a first order plant or process. The differential equation for the plant or process is shown here. M is the manipulated input to the plant, as shown in the block diagram. C is the controlled variable. Tau is the time constant. The controller will be a PID controller. The plant and the sensor are part of the analog world. The computer, controller, reference input are part of the digital world. This is a computer-controlled closed-loop system. We assume that the process dynamics are known. It's a first-order plant. We will assume the sensor is ideal, so this transfer function is 1. We assume that the computer output is a staircase function. That is, the output is given at sample instance and then held constant until the next sample instant at which it assumes a new value. This is called sample and hold. And the time required to sample the process output and produce the process input is much, much smaller than the sample period. So we sample from the sensor, we compute the controller output, and all that happens in much faster than the sample period. These are our assumptions. So consider this first order process. Tau is the time constant, K is the process gain. The initial condition is at T equals zero, C has a value of C zero, that's our initial condition. And the input we will assume is a constant, and it's constant during that first sample period. So it's constant from zero to T, where T is the sample period. To solve this equation, the solution result would be C is equal to capital C E to the minus T over tau plus K times M zero. C is just a constant of integration. From the initial condition, we can solve for what C is. C is equal to C zero minus K M zero. Thus, the solution is C is equal to C zero E to the minus T over tau plus k m0 1 minus e to the minus t over tau and c at time capital t which is the sample period then is c0 e to the minus capital t over tau plus k m0 1 minus e to the minus capital t over tau so this is the solution to our differential equation at the first sample instant. The corresponding first order difference equation says that C at the present instant minus C one sample period before times E to the minus capital T over tau equals K times the manipulated input one sample period before or N minus one times one minus E to the minus the sample period capital T divided by tau, or rewriting it as the present value of C, the controlled variable, equals the value of C one sample period earlier times E to the minus capital T over tau, plus the manipulated input to the plant one sample period earlier times K times one minus E to the minus capital T over tau. This yields the exact response values at sample instance, assuming the input is held constant during any sample period. That was the assumption of sample and hold. So this then is our control algorithm. It gives us the control variable at some instant in time based on the previous value of the control variable and the previous input to our controller. Consider the controller. 
It obtains sample process value CN, which is the present value of the control variable. It calculates the present error, which is the reference input minus the value of the control variable at this instant in time. Rn is the desired value or the command. It then computes the manipulated process input M at this sample instant, and then it outputs M sub N to the plant. This is what the controller does. The assumption here is that the input to the process is a sequence of constant values that change instantaneously at the beginning of each sample period and are then held constant for that sample period until the next sample instant. A typical control algorithm um, looks like this. The current value of the manipulated input to the plant equals the previous value of M plus K0 times the present error plus K1 times the error one sample period ago plus K2 times the error two sample periods ago. Consider a PID controller. The proportional controller looks like this. It says the manipulated input is proportional to the present error, or in difference equation form, MN equals KP times EN, or MN minus one equals KP times EN minus one. If we write the difference between MN and MN minus one, it equals KP times EN minus E and minus one. For integral control, the manipulated input to the plant is proportional to the integral of the error, or MN equals the integral gain times the summation of the area under the curve, the rectangle. This is T, the sample period, times the value of the error at j equal to one, that sample instant. This is called the backward rectangle rule. So in other words, the area under the curve is the value of the error at the sample instant times t, which is the width of these rectangles. This is the backward rectangle rule. So mn equals ki times the summation between j equal one and n minus one of T E J plus K I times T E N. I've just separated out this summation to between J equal one and N minus one, and then the value at N. I can write this as M N equals, this term here is M N minus one plus K I T times E N, or, MN minus MN minus one equals KI times T times EN. And this is my backward rectangle rule. Derivative control says the manipulated input to the plant is proportional to the derivative of the error. The derivative of the error using a simple backward difference rule is EN minus EN minus one divided by the sample period. So it's the tangent to the line at the sample instant. It's the slope of that. So MN equals KD times EN minus EN minus one over T. MN minus one then equals KD times EN minus one minus EN minus two over T. So the difference between MN and MN minus one equals KD over T times EN minus two, EN minus one plus EN minus two. So now we have difference equations for proportional control, for integral control, and for derivative control. So in summary, for PID control, MN minus MN minus one equals K zero EN plus K one EN minus one plus K two EN minus two. 
and substituting in what we know for proportional integral and derivative control, that equals kp times en minus en minus 1 plus ki times ten plus kd over t times en minus 2 en minus 1 plus en minus 2. If I then group terms and write expressions for k0, k1, and k2 in the general expression for the control algorithm, I find k0 is given by this expression, k1 by this expression, k2 by this expression. And these are all functions of the sample period. Note, difference between magnitudes of the coefficients are often just as important as their relative magnitudes. Now we look at something analogous to the differential operator, which says take the derivative, and it's the backshift operator. The differential operator transforms a differential equation into a algebraic equation. The backshift operator transforms a difference equation into an algebraic equation. So here we obtain discrete transfer functions. We develop block diagrams. We use algebraic techniques for manipulation purposes. So B operating on Y at the N instant equals Y at the N minus one instant. B squared operating on Y N equals Y N minus two. B to the J, operating on y n equals y to the n minus j. So our process is tau times dc dt plus c equals k times m. And we know that cn equals cn minus 1 times e to the minus t over tau plus m n minus 1 times k times 1 minus e to the minus t over tau. Cn minus 1 can be written as b times Cn. Mn minus 1 can be written as b times Mn. So then Cn times 1 minus b e to the minus t over tau equals Mn times b times k times 1 minus e to the minus t over tau. So the discrete transfer function of Cn over Mn equals k times 1 minus e to the minus t over tau times b over 1 minus e to the minus t over tau times b. And this is my discrete transfer function in terms of the backshift operator b, analogous to the transfer function in terms of the differential operator d. The controller difference equation is mn minus mn minus 1 equals k0 en plus k1 en minus 1 plus k2 en minus 2. If I just consider a pi controller, I set the derivative control gain to 0. Then k0 equals kp plus ki times t. k1 equals minus kp. k2 equals 0. So then mn minus mn minus 1 equals kp plus kit all times en minus kp times en minus 1. Using the backshift operator, mn minus b times mn equals kp plus ki times t, that whole quantity times en minus kp b times en. Solving for the discrete transfer function mn over en, I get this expression, which is now my discrete transfer function in terms of the backshift operator. I know the closed loop transfer function is given by c over r, which is gc gp over 1 plus gc gp. gp is the process, gc is the controller, and we assume that the sensor is ideal, hence h is equal to 1. If I substitute in for the controller for gc, which is this expression here, and from the previous slide, gp, into the transfer function, 
I then solve for the closed loop transfer function. So if I define C1, C2, and C3 to be these expressions, then GC is given by this transfer function, GP by this transfer function. Substituting into the expression for the closed loop system transfer function, I then go through the algebra and I get my result shown here in terms of the backshift operator B. This is my closed loop transfer function. It's a discrete transfer function in terms of the backshift operator. Note, we assume the input to the plant is assumed constant between samples, sample and hold. So the closed loop transfer function says that Cn equals this term times Cn minus one, plus this term times Cn minus two, plus this term times Rn minus one, plus this term times Rn minus two, where C1, C2, and C3 are defined as shown. So we have two different transform methods. The Laplace transform uses the Laplace variable S, or the differential operator, which is equivalent to transform a differential equation into an algebraic equation. The Z transform uses the variable Z, which is related to the backshift operator B by the reciprocal to create a discrete transfer function, and that's algebraic also. And this is only true when a zero order hold is present at the input of a continuous system. So we see here for the PID controller, MN minus MN minus one equals K zero times EN plus K one times EN minus two plus K two times EN minus two. I can write this in terms of the backshift operator or in terms of Z because they're just related by the reciprocal. So this is the PID controller where KZ, K0, K1, and K2 are given by these expressions. And if I only have PI control, then KD is equal to zero. And for the PI controller, in terms of the backshift operator, the discrete transfer function is given by this expression. And in terms of Z, where Z is equal to one over B and vice versa, m over e is given by this transfer function, which is called the z transfer function. This then concludes the presentation on feedback control system basics. Thank you for your attention.